Hello and welcome to today's episode of the Sports Journals here on the So What's the Catch Facebook page. Quick order of business before we get into the actual episode. From now on, we are not going to be recording the Sports Generals and So What's the Catch on the same day. So What's the Catch is going to be remain where it is every Wednesday from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock with myself, Brian, James, and Chirk. And then this show, the Sports Generals, is going to be moving to Thursdays from 12.30 to 1.30. Cool? All right, cool. So let's get into it today because we have got a lot to talk about. And when I say we have a lot, I mean it. (laughs) So we are calling this our free Super Bowl week show because it's not Super Bowl week yet. The hype is there, but it's not officially Super Bowl week. So the first thing we're going to get into is, um, I guess there's no other way to say this, the Brian Flores situation. Now, a couple weeks back, when we were talking about which coaches were going to get fired and which coaches we think are going to get hired where, I actually texted my Uncle Sky and my cousin Mark, who are big Miami Dolphins fans, and my Uncle Scott texted me back, and he had a lot to say about it. So I'll run you through some of the comments, and feel free to comment on anything. So first thing, my Uncle before Scott. Before you start, before you start, can we say hello? Oh, yeah. yeah. Hey, y'all. <laughs> What's up, guys? I'm Jason. I'm an Aries. <laughs> what the? Brian. That I was like one of the worst the videos I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> Straight to the point, huh? Yeah. yeah. Go on, go on. You're on the roll here, brother, so I'm going to let you get back to it. All right. Anyway, so he said, short term, I think it will hurt the Dolphins. Long term, I actually think it would be beneficial if they pick the right successor. Flo, forced owner, Stephen Ross's hands, and lost power struggle. Question... Question, he is the best defensive coach in my opinion. The story is starting to slowly come out about a toxic workplace environment and Flo was a big part of the reason. I think it is next in his next go around as a retread, he will be successful and may win a, may win a Super Bowl. Hopefully the Dolphins get either Doug Peterson or Jim Hardball as a, as a successor. Right. Well, we know one of those names can be crossed off the list because Harbaugh, uh, he, he announced he's staying with Michigan yesterday. Um, right. But to this point, um, that's an interesting perspective from some Dolphins fans. Uh, it sounds to me like they think that Coach Flores may be to blame for some of those things. Um, and I hadn't really heard any of that myself. So that's very interesting, definitely. Um, but I think the major issue going on with Coach Flores now is that uh, – He is suing the NFL. Um, He has decided to sue uh, the NFL and all 32 teams. Um, Basically, what had happened was uh, he was scheduled to do an interview with the New York Giants, and uh, apparently the Giants already had their guy in Brian Dable. Um, Coach Belichick accidentally texts Brian Flores, hey, congratulations on getting the job. Thinking it's Brian Dable before before Flores even had an interview yet. So he's like, wait, so he thinks I'm Dable and he's saying Dable has the job. So bad situation, bad look for the Giants. Yeah, Um, but it it gets worse. It it appears that what they're doing is circumventing the Rooney rule. Um, And and that's in place to ensure that, you know, black head coaches in the NFL have a fair shot. Um, And I think after what just happened in Miami with, with Coach Flores and the way he ended the season on such a, you know, a positive note, and then he gets fired, you know, it's like, it, it just is not a good look for the NFL as a whole right now, because it, it, you wonder if had Brian Flores been a whitehead coach, had he been held to the same standard in Miami? Because I, I, I mean, honestly, I don't think that he would, you know, I can't name many whitehead coaches who ever won seven out of their last eight games and got fired. I mean, yeah, I can had a winning season last year, um, was in playoff contention. And this Rooney rule, man, it, this, this call it for what it is. This is a slap in the face. It's um, it's, it really is. 
It's it's just a it's a it's a box you got to check when you're interviewing candidates, but you already got your candidates selected. Uh, Brian De- Brian Flores was the best prospect, and we all was on the same on the board with saying that a couple of episodes. I agree. And I what's happening? Happen oh, absolutely. Um, it just it, it what Brian has done is he's he's demonstrated even though he's sacrificing his career. He's putting his career on the line because it's, it's I mean, he might get blackballed for this. I'm just be real. But yeah, he's doing this, he's laying yeah, the groundwork down. Now. He's laying the groundwork down. Um, Hugh Jackson came out yesterday in a 14 minute exclusive interview uh, with ESPN on Sports Center and talked about how he felt that he had a similar situation with the Haslams. And, um, even though it wasn't money that he was paid to lose, he was guaranteed an extension on his contract, which if you slice it and dice it, that could come out to money if you mm-hmm. want to calculate it that way. But it's just it, – it's, it's paying the bigger picture, guys, is that, you know, even though um, the Rooney Rule was instilled, installed to assure minority candidates would have fair, equal opportunity to candidacy, that's not the case. And um, this not only is a black eye to um, the integrity of the, of the league, but from a Vegas standpoint, if Ross is paid Flores to lose games purposely to tank just for draft picks, that throws the whole Las Vegas integrity out the window. So mm-hmm. it's just a bad look all the way around. Right. And here's the thing. The way I had heard this case originally, I didn't hear that he was su- suing all 32 teams. I heard he was suing the NFL and the Dolphins, Giants, and Broncos. That's the way like, I had heard the story initially. And the reason he was going after the Broncos is because he said like, when John Elway and came in for his interview, he would... He was hungover, and he was an hour later, so something like that. And so that's why I'm hearing he's going after the Broncos. They leaked that information. That's what. No, that's what Flores. That's is what saying. Flores is claiming that when he had an interview with the Broncos, um, that John Elway showed up. He looked disheveled and uh, disinterested in, in the meeting. Oh, okay. And, okay. and the vibe he got was essentially like, oh, I'm here to check the Rooney Rule box. And that's it. And, yeah, that's, right. that's unfortunate. Man. I think they had already, had already selected Vic Fangio as their head coach, too. Yeah, they did. They had already made up their mind about Fangio, so. Yeah. Which, no. you know, that, that decision ended up biting him in the ass because it didn't do anything for him. It's, it's the bigger and, and again, not only has Flores and Hugh Jackson shed a light on the biggest problem, which is, you know, this this league is majority dominated by African American players, mm-hmm. and the coaching hierarchy, the higher you get, the lower that number becomes, and that doesn't really it's not making sense, man. It, it don't make sense. Matter. Yeah, and it's a, you know it just it, it just illustrates the um, unwritten rule. Whereas we know this is going on behind the scenes, we just couldn't prove it. Yeah. Uh, but you know, this is what it is. And what are you going to do, Roger Goodell, to rectify this problem? Because this 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 can't continue. Right, mm-hmm. right, Brian. We you and I, you and I, along with James and Chirk, talked about this on so what's the catch yesterday. When players and coaches or outsiders have tried to go against the NFL in court, it usually results in the NFL winning, whether it was um, Colin Kaepernick and all that. He ended up losing. Or when the concussion doctors tried to make an issue out of everything, you know, with concussions, they lost. I'm sure there's there's, I'm sure there's other examples I'm missing, but I, my overall point remains the same. When you try to go up against the NFL in court, you are most likely going to lose, 
and then you will be made an example of as black sheep where like Colin Kaepernick after everything he did was completely exiled mm -hmm. he's not going to get another job as a quarterback not because of his talents but because of the fact that if somebody signs him but let's say let's say a team does sign him you're going to get all that luggage and drama that and political stuff that goes along with it does the team really want that no and i yeah, tell you this leave, oh you go ahead i'm sorry well, I just wanted to say real quick, we have to remember that Goodell works for the owners. He doesn't work for the players. Bingo. And that's, and that's part of the problem um, because it's the players versus the owners, and the owners are the ones with all the money and all the power, and they're all old white guys. But yeah, he didn't I mean, want to know. Like, it's, it's a bunch of old white guys with all the money and all the power in the NFL, and the commissioner of the league works for them. So when you're going versus the commissioner and versus the owners, you're going versus – the most powerful people in the NFL, which is the most, you know, the biggest league in the United States. It's, it's a powerful entity, and there are power structures in place that, unfortunately, when, when a guy like Kaepernick takes a stand or a guy like Brian Flores comes out and, and reveals some of the shady inner workings of the NFL, um, unfortunately, due to that power structure, they get blackballed and they never work in the league again. Correct. This is slippery slope for the league when – because you're right um, – just to, just to hammer back what you said, actually, uh, Josh, uh, the league usually beats everybody they go against in court. And we get that. However, their new opponent is going to be Las Vegas because, like I stated, when there's money that's involved and there's bets that's being applied to these games and you have the owner on record indicating that, hey, I'll just pay you 100000 Go ahead and lose these games for me, please. Mm -hmm. And there's people that's really betting. They're you know they got what, however they got the money that's up to them. But that's when it becomes a whole different element because Vegas is not going to be too pleased about this as well. So right. it's, it's, no. it's they got yeah they got their work cut out for them. So I know that I know that you're when you're talking about Vegas, you're talking about sports gambling and betting mm -hmm. on right, but. I don't know. Let's not get into the whole the betting odds thing. No, no, no. no. I'm but not the getting point The point remains that, like, if, if the NFL wants to promote sports gambling, and they are, they have deals with FanBook. They have deals with DraftKings. Right. Um, Integrity. They're talking about in the states where it's legal, um, adding uh, ticket windows at stadiums to play, you know, to place bets in the stadium. So no, that's this not even what I was going towards, actually. That. Okay, can I finish my point? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, is like if you want to incorporate and make that a part of your game, um, and there's owners who are intentionally throwing those games, you mm -hmm. have a very, very big problem. And I think that's what's like what Jason is saying here is like mm -hmm. this is going to be taken to court by a lot more people outside of the NFL. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of money and a lot of power because we got to remember the people that own those casinos. They're not the big players like either. So. Yeah, you got two different elements, man. Racist. It's, it's, it's a racial element to this, which we already knew that was going on behind the scenes. We just couldn't prove it. Now we right. can. And then, again, the integrity of the league. If this mm -hmm. is supposed to be everybody's plan to win, you can't yeah. justify it by saying, hey, I'll pay you some money to lose. That doesn't right. even operate the way same way. Yeah, Josh, I thought you were about to go into your spiel about how you don't understand the odds. <laughs> that's why oh. I was like, let's save that for another time. No, that's no, not what, what were you I gonna was say? Going. What were you going to say then? So what I was actually going to say is um, I think this is a bigger problem because I do agree with what you're saying about Vegas and the betting odds and all that. But think about it. The, the Raiders are now in Las Vegas. So mm -hmm. I – I don't know how much of a factor that will play necessarily, if any, but I still, but I think it could be maybe a small factor. Well, that's one team, though. You got to understand, Josh. Betting is for everything. all 32. Like, this, exactly. this is – you can – racquetball. It doesn't even matter. If it it's doesn't a matter sport, if you're in Topeka, Kansas, yeah. or if you're in Las Vegas. Like, it don't matter at all. Team, like, it's – yeah. 
Money's on the well, table. I, I don't necessarily think fair. having a team located in Vegas is going to be problematic in terms. The bigger problem is owners like Stephen M. Ross paying head coaches mm-hmm. to tank games. That's the problem that you got to worry about then players in Las Vegas getting involved. Like, I, I don't think that's going to be – that's more of like a movie storyline than anything I think that would actually mm-hmm. happen. Yeah, it, it, it's, yeah, it's so fortunate. Yeah. Did we lose you, Josh? No, I'm here. But what do we got next, buddy? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I I thought one of you was going to take it, but that's fine. No, I thought you were hosting today. My bad. <laughs> um. Anyway, so I guess going off of that, we've had a bunch of other coaches hired. And a couple me, big ones. The most surprising one would actually be Matt Eberflus being hired by the Bears. I think this was completely, completely the wrong decision. I love yeah, that. I agree with you there. I was a little puzzled. By that one. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little puzzled by, um, by the Bears' decision as well. I thought with, with them investing so much in Justin Fields and in his future, I thought they would be more towards an offensive guy or you know a quarterback guru. Um, but they went, you know, with the defensive guy. And I don't necessarily think that's wrong or anything. It just – it kind of caught me by surprise. I, I didn't yeah. expect them to head that direction. Yeah, it's, I rarely, think- you, it's rarely you find a uh, defensive coordinator to have success, you know, unless you um, – you know, it's a rare exception to it. But the Bears, they, they're, you, they're traditionally known for having great linebackers and good defenses all mm-hmm. the time. But quarterbacks – what to Sid Luckman? You know that's last best quarterback I can think of, and Jim McMahon. You would think the off the focus would be more on offense, and it wasn't. And yeah. that was absolutely a head scratcher. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I right. agree. Here's my thing, and I'll ex- here's why I think it's completely the wrong decision. Because think about it. they gave up a ton of draft capital to move up last year in the draft to go get who the guy they think is going to be their franchise quarterback in Justin Fields. Hmm. So you want an offensive mind. I would think you would want an offensive minded coach to bring that, to bring the best out of Justin Fields, really develop that offense. I mean, we saw what Brian Dayball did it, with Josh Allen in Buffalo, we we've, we've seen what Eric Bieniemy is doing in Kansas City with Patrick Mahomes. Um, we'll circle back to the Chiefs a little bit later when we get to the conference championship games, but still, the point remains the same. Um, and you could there are countless other examples. So I think it was. Completely the wrong decision. I think it was kind of stupid by the Bears to hire a defensive coach, if I'm being perfectly honest with you. Yeah, if I was a Bears fan, I wouldn't be excited by this move at all. It makes no sense. I wouldn't either. Especially the direction the league is going in. We all know it's an offensive league. Mm -hmm. Uh, Points. That's pretty much what everyone cares about. How much points are you scoring? And to go in a different direction. I mean, we're seeing how this – We've seen this experiment happen recently with Denver. You know, mm-hmm. uh, it's just like history repeating itself. Just, it is. Yeah, you're yeah. right. That's a good example. Um, and it's a perfect transition, too, because the Broncos hired Nathaniel Hackett as their head coach. Then they hired another Packers guy to be their offensive coordinator. And so everybody's trying to put the pieces together. Oh, that automatically means Aaron Rodgers is going to Denver. If I was Aaron Rodgers, I would say, you really think I'm going to go into the AFC West where I got to deal with Justin Herbert twice a year, Patrick Mahomes twice a year, Derek Carr twice a year? No way. Oh, Pittsburgh. You you got to deal with, in Pittsburgh, you got to deal with the Cleveland Browns who, who knows, it, it, what we're going to look like next, this coming season. Right. Um, you got to deal with Baltimore, which Baltimore's a formidable. And you got to deal with Cincinnati, who's in the Super Bowl. But 
that division doesn't near look nearly as formidable or as difficult as the AFC West does. So if I'm Aaron Rodgers, I'm putting on the black and gold and wearing the helmet with the logo only on one side. I hope not. Hey, I hope, he is, I hope not too. Hey, it, just the AFC in general. AFC has an abundance of quarterbacks there. So yeah. it's just you could pick your poison on even which division you decide to go to, but you're gonna have the same problems. Um, it seems like the Steelers are more faxated on Jimmy Garoppolo for some reason. I don't know. Yeah, that's that's really the rumors that's now. being circulated. Um, yeah. Coach Tomlin is down at the Senior Bowl uh, taking a look at Ma- uh, Malik Willis, the Liberty quarterback, and uh, word on the street is that they're very fond of him. Mm. Um, so Steelers uh, really interested in, in maybe um, drafting him this upcoming uh, year, which is interesting, you know, and they could still do that. They could still do that and bring in Rodgers, you know, that would be a, a good guy to learn behind for sure. You know? Yeah. Actually, a couple of years back when the Eagles drafted Jalen Hurts, I thought for sure the Steelers were going to draft him. I thought it made to- perfect sense for the Steelers to draft it, uh, Jalen Hurts. Mm-hmm. But looking at the bigger picture, kind of like what you were alluding to, Jason, the AFC has fully cemented itself as the mm-hmm. top conference in the in the NFL. Because like we said, you got Josh Allen, you got Joe Burrow, Patrick Mahomes, Derek Carr, Lamar Jackson, um, Justin Herbert, Mac Jones could be on the uprise. We'll have to see. It was only his rookie year. Um, and I'm sure I'm not re- going to include Baker Mayfield in that mix. Sorry, but he's not. But let me apologize. <laughs> but here's my thing with Aaron Rod or with Tom Brady retiring and Aaron Rodgers seemingly done in Green Bay, who's going to be the top team in the NFC moving forward? Is it the Rams? Man, somebody from the NFC West, I would think. You yeah, know, I mean, the Rams, the Cardinals, if the Cardinals continue to grow. Seahawks. Then, yeah. I got to disagree with you about the Cardinals, Brian. I Cliff Kingsbury has been a horrible head coach for them right from the start. Um, there's just not many other good teams, you know. There's Dallas, there's you know, a couple teams that you know, I don't know. I just and just to go back, I'm gonna say, just to go back to the um, the 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 team in Pittsburgh, um, you don't even want to say their name, unfortunately. Kenny Pickett, no, he kind of has that Ben Rivalsberger body style, he kind of has an AFC North edge to him, Mm -hmm. uh, tough. I can run, I can throw, but no, he he gives that Ben Rivalsberger type of approach. So, no, it's going to be interesting to see if they take a quarterback because from what the scouts are saying, this is in a real good league or a good draft. The first team that Pickett talked to. Really? So I heard heard that the Cleveland Browns were the first team to uh, contact Kenny Pickett about potentially drafting him in the first round. So. I, I hope that's, that's just a smoke screen. If that doesn't show <laughs> where we're at with Baker Mayfield, I don't know what does. Mm-hmm. We need to trade for – there's no – as far as I've seen, there's no quarterback in the draft that can help our team. Mm-hmm. So I hope this yeah. is a smoke screen talk. Mm-hmm. Honestly, though, like, I even, even though Big Ben played for the Steelers, and the Browns and Steelers have always had a rivalry, although, in my opinion, it's not the main rivalry anymore. It, the main rivalry for the Browns is now with the Baltimore Ravens, but we can have that dis- dif- discussion on a different day. My overall point, though, is even though Big Ben was a rival, I still enjoyed watching him play quarterback because he was just a different specimen because – You know, you see a lot of these quarterbacks now, when they run, they're doing it to, I'm going to run and make a play. Like, they're not looking to extend plays. They're trying to get yards. Big Ben wasn't like that. He says, okay, I'm going to extend the play. Wide receivers, you go get open. So Yeah, he was very good at improvising. He was. Uh, He, you know, it's. 
I got mixed emotions about him. Um, but he's a Hall of Famer, and he was good. He was actually great. Can be good and get to the Hall of Fame. So he was great. Yeah. Um, but it just seemed like the last few years, he was more of a, a dink and dunk. Like the old Ben Roethlisberger would throw down the field. Yeah, yeah. He you know, uh, has a long arm. But the new one slants, slants. Yeah, I try to stay up. But, you know, he, yeah. he definitely took a lot of hits in his career. Yeah, yeah he's definitely past his prime. When he was in his mm-hmm. prime, definitely a different story. But I agree. Um, the other big coaching news we got to talk about, too, is uh, the Vikings decided to go with Kevin O'Connell over Jim Harbaugh after meeting with Harbaugh for nine hours yesterday. Oh, wow. I'm sure you're excited wow. about that. Josh, you mentioned uh, wow. You mentioned earlier about uh, teams and what directions they're heading and how Chicago decided to go with Eberflus and how you know offense is, is so important. And this Kevin O'Connell decision makes me feel like uh, the Vikings were thinking the same thing about Harbaugh was, you know, in the seven years since you've left San Francisco, has offense in the NFL passed you by? You know, are you not, you know, capable of e- evolving into what's necessary to play today's game? And ultimately, at the end of the day, I think they shocked a lot of people when they made the decision, you know, not to extend the offer to him. Um, so I think that speaks to your point earlier, Josh. I think you made a really good point. And this just drives that home, you know. It's yeah. it goes to show that offense is very important. Um, and, you know, the, the Vikings decided to go that direction, whereas Chicago went the other direction, which was kind of puzzling. Um, yeah. But, yeah, it, like I said, good, good point, Josh. I mean, I know you're celebrating that move of Jim Hardball going back because you are all about the maize and blue, and I'm sure – we know your feelings about that game last year against Ohio State. Mm. You, you know we'll be coming for revenge on you when we come. I should I should specify. When I say we, I'm not talking about Ohio State. I'm talking about Penn State. <laughs> so, Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Yeah, I don't I don't I don't want to spend too much time talking about Michigan because I don't think many of our viewers particularly care about Michigan. Um, but, but yeah, as I a fan, I was definitely relieved. Um it would have set the university back a few years to have to but, uh, enter into a coach, uh, coaching search on national signing day like it it would have set us back. <laughs> I want to say this. I'm Harbaugh even, you know, yeah, he's quirky. I get that. And he's, a, you know, he's him. It's cool. But he is a winner. He turns franchises around. He's changed Stanford around. He turned the 49ers around. He turned Michigan around. Michigan's averaging nine wins a season because of him. Um, right. So I wouldn't he say that he lost a step. Not there. It was a big, big jump. Shaw, man. Yeah, that's a whole different discussion. But mm-hmm. he changes cultures. And yeah. he does have that defensive pedigree. But, you know, they just got off of Mike Zimmerman. Mm-hmm. So I could see them saying, well, you know, let's still hear what he got to say. And then the owner just come in and say, no, I want to go offense. That's mm-hmm. the new vision. So. Yeah. Um, I think Harbaugh is – hey, you know, there was a rumor that the Browns tried to trade for him when he was at the 49ers. I'm not sure if a lot yeah, of y'all yeah. are familiar with this. Yeah, I remember. They were kind of fond of him. We are going to trade them – we was going to trade them, I believe, two first-round picks mm-hmm. for Jim Harbaugh. Um, yeah, that would have been interesting if we had him. But, you know, he's, he's a good coach, man. I mean, he's weird, but he's still good. Yeah. That, there's there's some one thing I could say about Harbaugh. It, it's not always going to be good. It's not always going to be bad. But it's always going to be weird. <laughs> he <laughs> makes it entertaining. Yeah, uh, he does. He's but a space I, cadet, man. He's an interesting cat. Uh, yeah, I like to say he's Bill Walton without the drugs. <laughs> I wonder if this did this hurt their um, Bill Walton. Did this hurt their signing? Um, signing some college kids though. I I would think it did. Uh, we didn't really lose any big recruits because of this. Um, okay. but, you know, we were only eighth in recruiting this year, um, where there was some momentum early in the recruiting cycle for them to trend towards like number one, number two. Mm-hmm. Um, and it really put a lot of things on hold. Um, okay. so we didn't make any big splash signings on national signing day. Um, so it was more, um, 
this is more just addition by not subtracting. Uh, it, it's just so untrustworthy, though. Like, if he would do that on National Signing Day, well, and he, 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 the messaging there is, you know, I think he was a little upset about how, you know, they asked him to take a, such a dramatic pay cut um, a couple years ago. You know, he wasn't too happy about how that went down. Um, there's a lot of a lot of things he hasn't been happy at about with his tenure at Michigan, um, from NIL stuff to uh, academic standards being <laughs> high, um, to uh, trying to attract transfer students, but they transfer in and uh, two years worth of their transfer credits from their previous school don't transfer over because the standards are too high. Like there's all kinds of things that like he's trying to change and trying to say, like, if you want to be an elite football program, like you got to start doing what the elite programs are doing. That's what Ohio State does. You know, that's what the SEC does. And, you know, they've been very stubborn. So I think that he did this on National Signing Day almost as a way, like, hey, you better realize how good you got it with me, you know. Because yeah, that's, uh, I was almost all, gone, you know. They, they always had that, that curriculum, though. Michigan has a higher, you know, educational requirement. So I would have thought he would have been new, something like that, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, that they, they – they, maintain higher standards than is necessary by the big 10. Um, and that's one of the things that he doesn't like, cause it's why, why should we have to hold our standards higher than any other team in our conference? You know, we should all be striving for the same thing. Speaking right. of standards, the Raiders, they just took on uh, Josh McDaniels and here we go with the Bill Belichick coaching tree guys. Mm -hmm. uh, he actually uh, went to Denver. He has his success. That's when Tim Tebow was quarterback at the time. He took a gamble, drafted up to get Tim Tebow, but it just seemed like once he left New England, he was in his own world. I'm not sure if that's going to be his his standard when he got I don't to the. Think he was ready yet when he went to Denver. I, th I think mm -hmm. it was too soon. He was too young. I think that he's grown a lot since his time in Denver, and I think that he's definitely going to be a much better coach in Oakland than he was there. I think he'll mm -hmm. learn from his mistakes, like you know. Trading up for a guy like Tim Tebow is pretty risky and not not the best move in hindsight. So uh, yeah, he definitely did some. I think if if he's not successful in Oakland, this might be his last shot. You know? Oh, I think this is absolutely his last shot. Um, yeah. He has to be successful in Las Vegas. Um, but here's my thing. You know, we t you mentioned how he did, was not successful in Denver. And then right when he was about to be introduced as the Colts head coach, yes. he, said, he said, nope, I'm out. Like I thought he was blackballed from that, just from that that move. Yeah, Ooh. so um we got a no. comment here. Definitely yeah. his last show, shot with the Raiders. Yeah. Says, we Johnny how Avalon. We Avalon. There we go. Yeah. Good when you have, yeah, I think I agree completely. It sounds easy like that is just coaching changes and moving carousel, but we also got to understand that there's a coaching staff that is, they have their lives going on too. They got kids going on to school. Their wife may be working. They have a life, and if a coach tells you, hey, you, I want you to be my offensive coordinator, we're going to the Indian Indianapolis or whatever, and you basically start to sever your ties with your current business in the state you live in. Mm -hmm. And when he just tells them, "Oh no, I'm gonna stay in New England," what about us? You know, like people got to understand the coaching staff also are impacted by these moves. Right, hundred oh, percent. Yeah, it, for sure. To go back to Jim Harbaugh for a sec, it was the same type of thing. Like, you know, at everybody on the coaching staff was expecting Harbaugh to leave. So they were prepping as if Harbaugh was not going to be the head coach next year. And then for him to turn around and say, yep, I'm never going to do this again. Like I'm here for the long term. If I was one of the Michigan on the Michigan coaching staff, I don't think I would welcome him back with open arms. I would be like, it would be an awkward thing for me. Yeah, there, I mean, there's there's things to be upset about by, you know, people on the staff. Their communication certainly could have been a lot better over the past couple of weeks. Um, 
And I, I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that like he was genuinely indecisive about this. Like I, I think he really, really did want it to work out and he wanted to go to the NFL. Um, but wasn't sure that it was going to work out. And then at the end of the day, the day it didn't. Um, and I, I think in hindsight, he probably wishes he handled it differently, knowing the outcome and what it was going to be. But, you know, he didn't know that at the time. He thought he was going to get the job. You know, he very much thought he was the right candidate and uh, didn't work out. So, yeah, I'm sure he regrets the way that it went down and, and how he handled it. But uh, maybe, they could, maybe they see how Brian Flores may feel now that, you know, um, it doesn't feel good at all to think you got something and something's aligned just for it to yeah. you know, pull it right from under you. So yeah, right. right. We uh, haven't even talked about the championship games yet. Do you guys want to get into that before we talk a little bit about Brady retiring? Yep. So who is the only one that? Pi- Wait, no, you picked the Bengals, didn't you, Jason? Yeah, but I, I, last week you've been picking them all year, so I'm gonna keep your G. You, you, you've been on the, you've been on the bandwagon. I was the only one right from the beginning. I have only – guess how many playoff games I've gotten wrong this whole time? One. You know, one. I'm going to review the stats. I'll have the accurate stats up. We'll see. <laughs> Still oh, no, no. <laughs> you can go back and watch the sport – the video that I made on my channel, Under to the Max. Uh, uh, San Francisco I, Green Bay is the only one you picked wrong. Correct. Yeah. No, but you've been accurate, though, Josh. Yeah. You've been accurate. Yeah, you've been on it for sure. Yes. To the point where I'm gonna need you. I'm gonna need to get your advice before I make my bets. Yeah, you so. better, you better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, keep it going. Right, so you better start picking against the spread so people can make some money off them. Dude, Man. I have been picking against the spread. The Bengals were not favored against the Chiefs. The Bengals were not favored against the Titans. Yeah, um, the that's some ideas for you. They're not favored against <laughs> the Cowboys. I don't think. Hey, I got some ideas for you, Josh. <laughs> Trust me, man. Keep making them picks. Uh, Why don't we start with the Bengals and the Chiefs what... game then, Josh? Why don't we uh, start there, and then we'll we'll work our way through the, the NFC after that. Look at what mm-hmm. Essence just said in the comments. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Josh is a time traveler and cheated unfair. I 100% agree with that comment. Hey, I support that statement. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, the Bengals they beat up on them. Bengals, see what happened, or from what I noticed was the Chiefs they are very arrogant, they got extremely arrogant to the point where I'm kind of glad that they fell on their face. Um, it was a play right before halftime where they had timeouts to waste, mm-hmm. they didn't waste the timeouts, right? Uh, Paul, uh, Josh. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Patrick Mahomes, my bad. He throws a behind pass and Cheetah gets stopped. And then the time expires and they get no points. Mm-hmm. And it just feel like they're so arrogant where they're like, a field goal, that's beneath us. We're going to go for a touchdown. And it's starting to get played out to me. And, and I think that they they realized that, you know, yeah, you, look, you may have lucked up against Buffalo last week. But time is, you know, it's just a matter of time for y'all on the clock. And, uh, yeah, the Bengals pulled it out in the overtime. Yeah, now I have, couldn't. Time's changed. Yeah, it's interesting to see, you know, for the first time, this goes the other way against Patrick Mahomes. You know, he's got mm-hmm. a 21-3 lead and, um, you know, makes a boneheaded play at the end of the first half with a lack of mm-hmm. awareness. And, Throws it up in the line of scrimmage and doesn't give anyone time to get out of bounds or, you know, anything. And uh, they end up getting no points out of that. And that ends up being, you know, the deciding factor. They only won the game by uh, – Cincinnati only won by three points. So, yeah, a yeah, field goal there changes everything. You know, they, they would have won that game in regulation. So, yeah, it's uh, – I think that a bit of arrogance might be the right the right word for it. Man. I think that we're up 21 to 3, like we're going to cruise to victory. Let's just put our foot on the gas and make it a yeah. play rather than playing it safe and, and making sure that you extend your lead, you know? Right. And here's the other thing, too, is I'm going to hold Eric Bianami and Andy Reid accountable for, for just not just this game, but some, they have a bit of a problem with Patrick Mahomes. And let me explain. They let him be too much of a 
what's the right word? Like Show, a showman, a token, like a circus act. Mm -hmm. Like I can, like he gets the green light on every everything, yeah. single type of pass, whether it's a a no look pass like that or yeah. stuff like, like sidearm pass like that. They enable it, yeah. Exactly, like. If you continue to enable that type of stuff, he's gonna. He may already be at the point where he's like, "I can do no wrong." Yeah, we already put him in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> yeah, so. like, like, hey, here's your gold jacket, Patrick Mahomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's only what in his fifth year in the league, something like uh, that. Yeah, like, and we're already he's crowning him like the face of the NFL and. All this yeah. and that, and you see him in all these State Farm commercials. Mm -hmm. The Patrick Price, he got Patrick Price. Yeah, <laughs> he got that Patrick Price. Exactly. <laughs> I, I think it's a pro it's a legit problem. Like, yeah, bring Patrick Mahomes in a little bit. Tell, explain to him, like you can't necessarily, you can't necessarily make all of these circus throws and like behind the back. Not that he's ever tried the behind the back pass. I think he has. Um, Actually, I think he has. <laughs> okay. But my point remains the same. Like, th that's just not how the NFL works. Right. Absolutely. He's been enabled. He's a good place for it in the regular season, you know, if you're beating up on a team or, you know, whatever. But in the postseason, like, you got to be smarter than that. You, every point counts, every drive matters. Uh, you should be focusing on getting points on every drive when you have the ball. And uh, I think he was more worried about, like, getting style points going in the half. You know? And, and you know what? Just just to add to this, man, because Bengals is fascinating. Yes, I'm morally, yeah, I hope, you know, I, I want to see them do well. But it's a, it's a part of me, man, where I'm like, man, we swept, the, and when I say we the Browns, we swept this team twice. I've seen the head-to-head -head matchups. We outmatch them, okay? And it's a common denominator that all of the teams are still left in the playoff or going to the Super Bowl, rather. They seem to have one important piece that we seem to be missing because we should have – that could have easily been us. Like, I, I, yeah, yeah, I'm kind of bitter, man. It's like you, your ex-girlfriend and she she have married someone, like, like, man, what about us? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. That's supposed to be me. <laughs> I wish it was Jason. I I, Jason, I wish it was that simple, but it's really not. Like, mm -hmm. just because, think about this. Just because you have a great quarterback, which Cincinnati does in Joe Burrow, mm -hmm. doesn't mean you're going to necessarily win right away. You need to right. pair him with the right coach. And he got needs that. In the right system, and at first it didn't look like Zach Taylor knew what the hell he was doing. Mm -hmm. But look at him; he's developed the offense amazingly well. And we'll get more into the Super Bowl next week because next week's going to be our actual Super Bowl show. But I'll tell you this right now: part of the reason why I'm picking Cincinnati is because. You know, the Rams are probably going to focus all of their energy, for the most part, on Jamar Chase. Because we've seen how special he is. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm picking, if I had to choose an X factor, I'm going with T. Higgins. Yeah. I can see that. It's just, it's, you know, it's just we already had the pieces. So that's why I kind of like, I may come off bitter. Oh, yeah, we have offensive line, defensive line. We have a great um, offensive structure. We have good coaching, so that one miss a piece that's glaring now. Put Joe Burrow on our team, and I think that we have a very similar. Oh, absolutely. Team. We we talking about repeat. Yeah, Bengals only went ten and seven. I mean, give us Joe Burrow, we can go ten and seven. I say we go yeah, twelve. We're we're all all 12 and, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying that we're a Super Bowl ready team. I'm kind of with Josh on that one. Like, I, I think that there are some pieces that we're missing, and there's some glaring. Some glaring holes, but I don't, you know, I, I think there the point remains for Jason that like if we had Joe Burrow on our team, you know, so we had Derek Carr on our team, right? Yeah, I mean, we, I think we got the holes fixed, in my opinion. Yeah, 
a good quarterback can take your offense to the next level, and that's what's happened in Cincinnati. Like you said, Zach Taylor wasn't looking great. His offense was not looking phenomenal until, you know, uh, Joey Burrow got there and started, things started clicking for him after he got healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, so mm-hmm. how much of it is him and how much of it is Burrow? And I, I think that Jason's point is, like, if you have an elite quarterback on your team, they can get you to that next level. They can Try carry the trailers. They can carry you to a Super Bowl. Because the Bengals got some big holes themselves. That offensive line is dreadful. Um, and if the Titans got to them nine times, I expect the Rams, Aaron Donald, and Vaughn Miller are going to be licking their chops. It's thick about getting to this guy, too. So, yeah, like, I kind of agree with Jason a little bit here. Like, we were very close to being where the Bengals are right now. There's two types of quarterbacks. More offensive weapons. Than, but I, I think that the, the point remains that with an elite quarterback, we, we could have made a run, you know. There's two types of quarterbacks. You got a tractor quarterback. That's a quarterback that pulls everyone with them. And you got a trailer quarterback. That means they need everything in front of them to be good in order for them to be successful. We right. have a trailer quarterback. And Joe Burrow's a tractor quarterback because he's pulling right. them because of the deficiencies that you just named. Coaching, offensive yeah, lines. So, like two that. type of quarterbacks, man. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so getting over to the NFC Championship game. That did not feel, first of all, that did not feel like a Rams home game. I thought the game was being played in San Francisco because it looked like it was about 60 40 in in favor of 49ers. Yeah, they even, uh, I I heard that they even tried uh, zip code restrictions on ticket sales too to prevent that from happening, and it still ended up being uh, heavily. I don't even even feel like that's fair morally. Yeah, it's uh, that's I want to check into that. in LA, though. It's like they they they're better at attracting opposing teams' fans than they are at attracting their own, unfortunately. Man, I, yeah, so I've seen I, the Steelers the play there, the and it'd be number of Steeler fans there, or the yeah. count like it's always like that. It's so far, so yeah, yeah, there's yeah, gonna be favorite. a ton of Bengals fans, I think, at that. I yeah. think so too. I mean, yeah. it's been so long for them, like they're gonna travel well. Um, so yeah, um. But looking at this NFC championship, if all the 49ers needed was good quarterback play from Jimmy G, and they would be playing the Bengals in the Super Bowl rather than the Rams. Totally but, agree. But Jimmy G is just not that guy. Mm. Um, just because you get – you are the quarterback playing in the Super Bowl does not mean you're a Super Bowl caliber quarterback. Let's make that clear. Like, to me, Jimmy G is not a Super Bowl caliber quarterback. When you think of why the 49ers got to that Super Bowl a couple years ago against Kansas City, you think of their run game, you think of George Kittle, you think of their defense, Kyle Shanahan. I'm just now getting to Jimmy G, and he's fifth on the list. Trailer. <laughs> he fits that analogy too. He 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 does. He needs every everything needs to be perfect for him to to perform well. And you know, he only completed 16 of 30 passes, and he had the one big interception as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, on the other side of things, Stafford, you know, he's, he's just falling out. He, he throws for 340 yards, two touchdowns, and a pick. Um, definitely had a better game, and that wasn't even a you know one of Stafford's best games this year. He he kind of had a, a little bit off of a day himself, and still is good enough to lead his team to victory because he's elite. You know that's it's the difference between the tractors and the trailers, like you're saying, Jason. It's it's. I'm a, I'm, I'm tempted to put a poll up because I just I just had an epiphany where I wonder who's more bitter. About this Super Bowl, is it us, the Browns fans, or Detroit fans? And the reason I say that is because, again, we should have beat the Bengals twice. We well, we did. We swept them. My bad. And then mm-hmm. you got Odell in the Super Bowl, mm-hmm. and it's like, all right, I don't even know who to root for. But then you got Matt Stafford, who's had a troubled history with Detroit. His first year with a new team, he's to the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, this is a guy that that his whole career, you know, other people in the NFL said, like, look, you guys don't realize how good this cat is. He's just oh, yeah. around him, you know. 
Um, and he's really proven it this year, you know. And if he could beat a, a San Francisco team with a with an okay Stafford performance, imagine you know what a great performance in the Super Bowl looked like for him. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I think expect, this is going to be a great Super Bowl. I do, too. I think it's yeah, going to be a shootout. Really I think we're going to see some offensive records broken. Yeah. Personally. I can see that, I too. I don't think – again, we'll get more in-depth about this next week, but do I think we're going to get, like, a Super Bowl 52-type game where it was, like, 41-33, to 33, which I was only off by two with my score prediction for that game. I said the final score was going to be 43-31. to 31. It's close. Yeah. So damn, I'm. Am, yeah, I becoming like, am I becoming like? Am I becoming like the Nostradamus or Mystic or as Conor McGregor likes to call himself, Mystic Mac? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're you're Nast- Nostradamus. <laughs> <laughs> well, we gotta get our picks on the. We gotta get our picks on the record, guys. So I mean, oh, no, we're doing that. Uh, we're gonna do that. Gonna next do it next week. week. Yeah, okay. we'll do that okay, next cool. week. How about Provo? We got picks. one more topic. We got one more topic <laughs> that we gotta squeeze in here um, before we go. We got the nine goat. minutes left, and we haven't talked about the goat retiring. So, everybody with with this nine minutes in mind, um, I'm sure we all have thoughts about Tom Brady. Um, so I'll let you guys get started on that, and then uh, I'll chime in at the end too. So with me, I wasn't willing to concede that he was the goat until I saw him leave New England. And go with not only play in the Super Bowl with Tampa Bay, but actually win it in his first year. And I know you guys feel the same, feel differently in that 28 to 3 was the moment. But for me, not to discredit what New England did in that game, but that felt more like an Atlanta choke job rather than a New England comeback. Again, that's not to discredit Tom Brady in any way, but I wanted to see if he could do it separate from Belichick, and he showed that he could. So here we go. I I see him as the GOAT um, just because, I mean, despite the the Super Bowl rings, despite the seven Super Bowl rings, despite that, um, he was the number one quarterback ever. Passing, passing yards rather, mm-hmm. passing touchdowns, mm-hmm. and his rating, overall rating, right? Uh, yeah, and then also his touchdown to interception ratio. He finished at twenty eight to two for his career. Yeah. That is by far the best touchdown to interception ratio. He finished with six hundred and twenty four regular season touchdowns and only two hundred and three interceptions. That's just um, a stat. Yeah. <laughs> At that, um, and yes, then also number that. number one in yards with eighty four thousand five hundred and twenty. Um, and then just quickly, I want to read off some of his other major accomplishments. Like you said, everybody knows seven time Super Bowl champ, five time mm-hmm. Super Bowl MVP, three time first team All Pro, uh, three time League MVP, including being the oldest to ever win the MVP in the NFL. Yeah, at age 40. So he did that at age forty. That's another record that he had. Um, also the most winningest quarterback of all time with 243 regular season wins, uh, being the most all time. Uh, and then that ratio as well, his win versus loss r- uh, ratio, also the best of all time. So not only does he have all, more rings than any other quarterback, he's also got every statistic in the book to back it up. So he went, uh, to, the, he went to the NFC yeah, divisionals. What'd you say? I said, went to the NFC Divisionals at the year, age of 44 years old, for crying out loud. Like, he threw over 5, what more yards. he got to do? He threw over 5,000 yards, 5,200 yards Crazy. as a 44-year-old right. man. Yeah, so like my wild. point was being, like, it, whether you're like Josh and it took you a little bit longer to get to that point, or you're like me and Jason and we saw it a little bit earlier in his career, everybody's gotten to the point now where they agree this man is the greatest of all time. Yes. And it's because of what, what I was just rattling off there, all of these numbers that just back it up, you know, um, numbers can lie. You know, you can use numbers to manipulate a, a narrative and try to create something of your own. But when you're consistently ranked number one, number one, number one, number one, all the way down, Playoffs. Uh, that's a pattern. <laughs> that's a pattern that, you know, uh, can't be separated, you know. Like Definitely that. a tractor, a John uh, Deere tractor. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, interestingly, 
I have a board here with every Super Bowl champion up to Super Bowl 53. And if, I'm going to try and see if I can get this. But he lost Super Bowl 42 against the Giants. You can see that right here, kind of. Mm-hmm. And then 10 years after that, he lost Super Bowl 52 against the Eagles. So I think that's kind of interesting that all three of his Super Bowl losses came against the NFC East because it was, went Giants in 42, he, Giants again in 46, and then the Eagles in 52. That is interesting. Defense yeah. aligns. When you rattle time, that's the only time to shake them up, and that's what happened. That's why he's not in the playoffs as we speak. Defensive right. line play makes it uncomfortable for him. Yeah, I and then I do want to make one more point about Tom Brady. Um, just that, like, when he came into this league, you know, he was not projected to be the GOAT, like, by any means necessary. Oh, no way. He, he was taken 199th. You know, there were six quarterbacks taken in front of him. Um, <laughs> he was Spurgeon the guy who his entire career at the University of Michigan um, was marred with quarterback controversy. Um, there was always controversy surrounding him and Drew Henson and who should be the starter. Uh, he did do some very good things in his career at Michigan. He did win a Citrus Bowl over Arkansas and then an Orange Bowl over Alabama, so two straight uh, bowl game wins over SEC, back when those bowl games actually used to really matter. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, he did some really nice things in college, but only 30 touchdowns, 17 INTs, not gaudy numbers like Burrow had or, or Tua had or any of these other young guys coming into the league now by any means. So just a guy who, who spent his whole career as an underdog, uh, to only turn into a guy that just could not be stopped and became an inevitable force. With the Mamba think. mentality. Mm. Yeah. yeah. yeah so, we have, so we have about four minutes remain, but interestingly with Brady, to continue on this, he didn't go retire like Big Ben did, where you could tell physically Big Ben was just done, like, he couldn't throw the ball down the field anymore like we had talked about earlier. and He just looked broken and all that. Brady, on the other hand, he looked like he could continue playing until uh, he more was years, like 50 yeah. or something. Yeah. I, I don't want to hold that against him by any means, but it's like – it's almost like – he was saying, okay, I'm tired of being beating up the rest of the league. Like, I'm going to leave now. Like, nobody, like, delivered. I'm not saying I wanted him injured necessarily. But nobody, like, you never really saw him get all beaten up or anything like that and get to the point where he, had, he was forced into retirement like a big Ben. So... Yeah, one of uh, his most underrated qualities, too, is his durability, you know. And then the, the best availability can be availability or the best ability is availability in the NFL at times. And for him, you know, he stayed healthy his whole career somehow. Took uh, care even of his body. A guy who was limited physically, you know, a guy that wasn't super strong and buff and built. You know, he was a guy that was very soft coming out of college. Um, but somehow he managed to stay healthy, you know, his whole career. Never really grew up big, strong, buff guy, you know, like he's always been in great shape, you know, but he's never been like a physically dominant force like a Cam Newton or some of these other bigger, you know, quarterbacks. So, yeah, he was dominated in his heart. Yeah. Mind in his heart. And that's all that you need. Mm -hmm. And the other interesting part about it is like, if you look at him, you're like, wait, he's the GOAT? Like, because he doesn't have like, he doesn't really have like a six pack or anything. He's not like this big imposing guy like Lawrence Taylor or well, Joe you know. Montana. They were saying that about Joe Montana. Like, yeah. Yeah, man. You know, he yeah, goes to go. So, like, it, he keeps that thought alive, like, that anybody with a dream of playing in the NFL, you know, can grow into something that, that people don't believe in. You know what I mean? Like, you can run a 5.44 yard dash and and look like an absolute joke with your shirt off and get drafted 199 and become the greatest player of all time. Here's um, your supermodel. Yeah. yeah. So Here's what and, I'm hoping doesn't happen, though, is now that Brady is retired, people are going to start keeping all this type of GOAT expectations and, like, all that on Patrick Mahomes because 
as we talked about earlier, Mahomes is already like, like I don't want to say out of control. Nobody should like, ever be held to Tom Brady's standard. It correct. wouldn't be fair. It wouldn't be fair to anyone. He is correct. the standard. Yeah, yeah. It's That's, like it's kind of like LeBron and his son, like. Nobody's expecting LeBron's son to come into the NBA and be the next LeBron James. Like they just want to see, they just want to see it, you know, him do well and, and be a good player and, and all that. But like, you don't want to hold anybody to that kind of standard. It's impossible to live up to that standard. And it's unfair. Right. Yeah, it's right. totally unfair. Well, well we guys, are- we managed to fit it all into an hour today. So uh, I know we were a little concerned we wouldn't get to everything. So yeah. Um, but yeah, we got to everything. Uh, it's been really fun. Um, do you guys have any last thoughts before we go? I think I've said everything I wanted to say about Brady. So yeah. Um, make sure y'all tune in next week. It will be same time, same place. It will be our Super Bowl show. We will be talking about every aspect of the big game. Why we think either the Rams or Bengals are going to win. I think I've made it no secret who I'm picking. I will go further into detail about why I'm picking the Bengals. But anyway, you guys got anything? Yeah. The Bengals represent the AFC North. Hold it down. But it's still always Browns. All right. You got anything, Brian? Uh, fuck the Bengals. All right. And we will end it on that. See you next week. Peace.